founding student members of this organization. Um, and it stands for Social Work Advocates for GLBT and Gender Nonconforming Equal Rights. It consists mainly of a School of Social Work, MSW and BSW, and also some doctoral students. Every year we put on uh, several events uh, and panel discussions. And so, which leads us to tonight, uh, where we are going to, we have a program in to, to commemorate Transgender Day of Remembrance. Now, I wanna let everybody know, we plan on recording this uh, presentation, including the questions and answers. And we hope to post it on our website, on the School of Social Work website, so that, I mean, this is important information and we want people to have access to it, of course, uh, after, the present, after the presentation. So if you're not okay with being recorded or you don't want your face to be recorded, uh, feel free to mute yourself or to, um, to undo the video component of, of, your, uh, of your panel there. But I want you all to know that. Uh, tonight we have three speakers. Um, Amara Dancy is going to be our host. She's waving. Uh, they're waving. And, um, and we will hear from uh, TJ Barkansky, as well as Jackie Barris, along with a poem from BSW student Amos. Um, and I don't see, you're on here somewhere. And so, so that'll be a, each person will speak uh, the two speakers will speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, Amos Kaufa will uh, recite his poem in between those two presentations. And then at the end, we, have, we will have time for uh, lots of uh, questions and answers. You can put your, your questions in the chat or you can use the raise hand function and I will, do, I will be moderating the chat and I will do my very best to keep track and make sure that everybody who wants to ask a question will be able to do so. But before we get on to the program, um, I think, I know, I hopefully most of you know this, but um, transgender people uh, and transgender persons, particularly transgender persons of color are really under threat um, in this country. The murder rates among this population are extremely high. And so on this day, before we get started with our presentation, I'd like us to do a minute of silence uh, to, in whatever way we want to, whether we want to pray to ourselves or reflect or honor uh, all, of those, all of those transgender people who have died at the hands of uh, violent transphobics. All right, so I'll ring the bell and then I'll ring it when we're at a minute. Okay, Amara, I think I'll turn the program over to you now. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody's doing good today and welcome to our Transgender Day of Remembrance event. Um, I am happy to host this event or co-host this event um, with 
our um, swagger group and the inclusion, intersectionality, diversity, equity, and advancement committee. Um, I forget who wanted to go first. Dr. Lasallo, can you tell me who was going first again? Uh, TJ. Okay. Um, so Random. I'm going to introduce TJ, um, who is the author of She, He, and Finding Me. TJ is a retired firefighter and EMT, and TJ is a um, transgender advocate, speaker, and educator who helps behavioral science students, families, and those living with gender dysphoria to better understand the issues faced by transgender people. He has appeared on television shows and make, makes public appearances to help raise awareness and acceptance of those who share his path. So TJ, if you would like to go ahead and um, begin your presentation. All right, thank you guys for having me. Um, so um, I was born in, uh, uh, in, in San Diego, um, raised, born and raised in San Diego. Um, I am a retired San Diego fireman. I was the first uh, San Diego fireman to uh, have a gender change. Um, it's a rare that I was actually, I stayed on my job and um, uh, uh, trans, trans, had a transition while I was on my um, job, um, which was very difficult um, in the early 90s. Um, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, most, a lot of transgender people don't uh, transition it, it, I did it before the don't ask, don't tell. Um, so, which was very difficult. Um, I, uh, the reason people don't transition usually when they're on their job is because they receive a lot. And during that time is because they received a lot of uh, uh, threats to, uh, to, for uh, people to be harmed. And, uh, and I did as well. Um, a lot of people, uh, weren't very kind um, while I was transitioning on my job, but I stayed on my job anyway. Um, I transitioned, uh, the doctor who, who I transitioned with was uh, Dr. Stanley Biber. He was the uh, world-renowned uh, transgender uh, doctor at that time who has, who has passed away um, since then. Um, and Marcy Bauer, who is now has taken over his practice and um, works in San Francisco at this time. Um, I decided to transition uh, because it was, uh, um, I felt it was the only option I could uh, have um, besides committing suicide. Um, I, um, I knew growing up that there was something different about myself, I guess. Um, but if, if back when I was growing up uh, in the 70s, there wasn't really, as my mother said, there wasn't really um, a lot um, of education uh, that we have education now about transgender people. Um, I think that she said that at one time that she had it to do different, she would have raised me as a boy. Um, a lot of, I think that I had a little bit different, a lot of people already assumed that I was a boy um, when I was growing up. Um, um, in school and things like that. My mother actually had to defend the fact that I wasn't, um, wasn't a boy. Um, so people treated me already at, like I was a boy. So, but like I said, my mother had to tell people I was a girl. So which actually that made it more difficult for people to, um, uh, it, was, it was more confusing when my mother was trying to tell people I was a girl, actually. Um, I was named after my mother, which my birth given name is Terry. Um, and so my name was spelled T-E-J-A-I. And so I was raised with my name like that. So when I went to school, it, my name also became a, a difficulty too. So people thought my name was TJ. I was, I looked like a boy, you know? So, um, it was pretty difficult, um, when I was, um, uh, growing up. Uh, so, uh, Anyway, so when, my whole life, you know, thinking that I was a, thinking, you know, I felt like a boy. Um, I didn't really know, you know, in the early 70s, you don't really know anything about being gay or you don't, it wasn't a big, in the San Diego, we moved from San Diego up into a smaller town in North County. And I didn't know a lot about um, lesbianism or anything like that. So you just kind of, you know, you just kind of go, it makes things difficult, you know, um, people treat you different. Um, my family didn't, 
uh, really treat me uh, different. Um, I, I grew up Mormon, so with, which made it even more difficult. Um, so we had uh, trying to conform to be a Mormon uh, in a Mormon family. Um, you had to wear dresses all the time. You had to, you know, um, conform to the Mormon church and uh, the rules and regulations of the Mormon church. And um, so being a, uh, as I got older, um, I just, I just became more rebellious and um, kn knowing that there was something wrong with me. And my mother took me to doctors and um, psychologists and things like that. And they, and at one point um, they just told my mom, you know, um, a doctor told my mom, you know, your son has uh, ADHD and we need to put your son on some medication. And my mom said, I, I don't have a son. It's my daughter. And the, and the, the doctors were kind of like, you know, we only see this behavior in, in young boys. And so with that, my mother, again, didn't know what to do with me. Um, and so I think as I was confused within my own gender, um, in my mom not knowing what to do, um, it makes it at that time made it more difficult. And so um, taking me to doctors and psychologists and um, I had a uh, brain uh brain tests and all kinds of things you know trying my mom and my parents trying to get me to figure out what was wrong with me um and so as an er early adolescence it would um, it became more difficult and um not only for me but it became more difficult for my parents um and so as and as i grew older i just i f found a little community um uh of uh girls that were, I guess they were called each, they called uh, dykes, I guess at that time, you know, they called it, and they liked girls. So I, I, I thought, well, that's the only answer I, I could have that if they like girls, I like girls. And then you just grow up, you thinking that you're gay. So in the, of course we're in the early eighties now. And then um, in, in San, living in the city, you know, you, you come across drag queens and then you think, well, how come these guys that are dressed like girls can be our transition are you would think that they were going to be women, but how can they become women, but women can't become men. So you, it gets, it was just constant turmoil that I had. Um, and so I looked a lot uh, to suicide, different ways to kill myself, but you know, and it, it was always a turmoil. Why can I, why can't I become a, a a boy or a man or, but women could become, um, um, but men could become women at that time because it wasn't, it wasn't really well known the, that kind of surgery, you know, it wasn't, uh, but there was a, so when I, um, I, you know, I would always find other things, ways to do other things like, so I joined the Navy I, or I would um, run away, you know, I just always, it was like I was running from, a, running away from myself, you know, um, and then I, I, uh, one day I, you know, I just came on my course of the talk shows were really big at that time. Um, I actually, uh, watched a, uh, program, uh, Geraldo Rivera, you guys, I'm, and, uh, there was a program where there was a, a guy that became a, a female that became a, a male. And that was, that was like, uh, the, an angel to me, you know, uh, I did all this research and this was in the early nineties and I, and eventually I, you know, I transitioned and uh, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to kind of condense my book. I'm sorry. So, uh, so, um, you know, it's living um, in a, a, you know, I went to so many therapists and so many psychologists and so many um, to try to find out what's wrong with me. And every, every time I did, it was, it was like, well, you have an eating disorder. Maybe you have a psychological disorder. Maybe you're bipolar. Maybe you're, you, I mean, it was always when you went, you know, first, like uh, Dr. LaSala said, like on the social work side of it, every time I went to a, to try to find out, you know, to seek some type of help psychologically, because you think you're nuts. I mean, <laughs> you know, that nobody would have an answer of, saying, hey, maybe you, you think that, and I would say, I, 
I feel like a, a, a boy or I feel like, you know, I'm gay and this is what was wrong. Nobody ever said you have gender dysphoria or you have, did you ever think about transit, uh, being, a, are you transgender? Nobody ever said that. They would always, it was always a medication. Maybe you're bipolar, maybe you're, it, it was always a pill um, until I watched the Geraldo Rivera show. Uh, and so, uh, which maybe that was, the, the pill I needed, the Geraldo Rivera show. And so when I, um, after I did the research, uh, and I met the guy that was actually on that show, he actually lived about three miles from me. And so, um, and then I um, did a lot of research on uh, transitioning, is if that was something that I really wanted to do. And so, um, if that was really, if that's the answer, because it's like, once you, you transition, there's really no turning back. And so I, I met with a psychologist that um, knew about transitioning. And uh, that is something that I, you know, I really wanted to do. And I, I did it. And, uh, and I researched the doctors, I researched the, um, um, and I, I research, and I, you know, I, it, it's something that you have to really dig within your deep within yourself. It's not something that you just um, do. It's not, a, it's not something that you just think about, well, today I'm just going to, you know, transition and, you know, it's, it's not something you just think about and then you're going to do it the next day. It's something that you really have to, it's something that you really, it's heartfelt, you know, um, and that it's with, it's really within, within you, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, my, I, I, I wrote about it in my book and, you know, my book was a uh, 10 years. I, I wrote, I journaled for 10 years and, uh, and I decided to write my book because it's not, there's not a lot of information on females to males. There is a lot of information on uh, male to female. I think more so than there is. I mean, I, Jackie probably could tell you, that, but there, when I went to go research stuff on um, female to male, there, there wasn't a lot of information. Um, there wasn't anybody that I could go and like a peer group that I could go and talk to and, and ask information or questions. Um, I had a lot of gay friends, but, um, when I started transitioning, um, actually I was, uh, a lot of the gay community that I was talked to, they didn't really want anything to do with me. I had very few gay friends that stuck with me. And uh, to this day are still my friends, but there wasn't, there wasn't, a, I was shunned by the gay community, the, le the lesbian community. Um, they would say things like, you know, you just, just admit that you're a lesbian and you need to just be a lesbian. It was very, it was very, it was interesting, you know? Um, so it's not like it is today. There's, there's so many different, um, it's LGBTQ. I don't know. I can't keep up with the acronyms, but um, uh, there's way too many in the alphabet for me. Uh, but I just, but when I was, like I said, in the early nineties, I mean, I was just shunned by the gay community. It would, they didn't want anything. The bar that I worked at, the bar that I, the gay bar that I worked at part-time, um, told me that I couldn't even go in there without a, um, without a female escort. So, um, there was a lot it was, there was a lot of good things about me transitioning because I am who I want to be. I'm happy, you know, um, I'm married, you know, and I have two kids, you know, um, and two boys and, you know, and, but then there was a lot of downfall about, there was something I lost, I lost some people that, um, that were part of my life, um, for years. Um, so, I mean, it's, there's some good, there's some good points to it. There's some bad point. I mean, there's some pros and cons, but that's with everything, you know? Um, but what really counts is that happiness that you have, you know, with yourself, you know, uh, sounds kind of selfish, but, you know, I always tell people, you know, I don't know why somebody's happiness brings other people's misery. You know, I, I do say that a lot, you know, so my happiness shouldn't bring, bring somebody else's mis misery. But as far as the social work part of it, you know, um, I think that when somebody, when I don't think a pill is the answer to everything, 
Um, medication is definitely not. I think that if you sincerely in your heart believe something and you want something, uh, I think that social workers should not push medication. I, I think they should really hear what you're trying to say. You sh they should help you to um, figure, answer your own questions. A good social worker will, will let you answer your own questions, you know, instead of telling you what you are supposed to be doing. So I, I think that that um, is uh, a good social worker. So uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Lasalas? Well, I think this was a really, I really appreciate the heartfelt, uh, you know, story you told about yourself and how you were willing to be so personal and, and really give it a, an emotional, I mean, I think you really painted a, an emotional picture of what this is like. That, you know, sometimes in social work education, we lose out on that, you know? So, so I'm really appreciative of that. And I, I see people nodding. My, my book is really, um, um, the lady who uh, helped me um, publish my book um, is with the Grief Diaries and she um, doesn't usually publish books like this. And my book is um, very, um, very in-depth, really, per it's really emotional um, and it's hard for me to read it. <laughs> um, it's very, I mean, it's very intense because um, I wouldn't do any, um, I've spoken at San Diego State, I've done a couple other things because I won't do, uh, it's not a freak show. It's, it's not a Jerry Springer show. You know, I think that it's really important for people to know that it's, it, transgender people are, are it, it, well, for, e for, each, for each person's journey, it's completely different. For my journey is different from Jackie's journey, you know, it's, and however you treat your journey, you know, is what you're, what you put into your journey is what you're going to get out of your journey. You know, like, so how I present myself to somebody is how I'm in. So what I always say to people is how I, if, if I want to integrate myself into society, I don't ever want to segregate myself, further segregate myself. So how I present myself to people is how I'm going to be received by people. So I can either, I, I, I never, like when I, with the fire department, when I, I, I loved my job, I could have very easily, very easily sued my, the fire department. I could have been a millionaire and been living like a king, but I loved the fire department. It, it was the job. I loved fighting brush fires. It was, if, if Misty didn't tell me I was broken and old by now, I still would probably do it. I, I loved it. You know what I mean? I'm 55. I love it. But here's the thing is that, that I chose to stay there. And I told those guys, I love my job. And so, and my fire chief told me, TJ, if, I don't care if you turn yourself into a giraffe as long as you do your job, right? <laughs> That's what he told me. But see, but I wanted these guys to know that I'm not any different. My mind isn't different what my what my genitalia is doesn't define how i am as a fireman i'm still the same person it's my i mean not to be kind of i would always tell i would joke to people excuse the pun i tell people i'm having an addict to me i'm not having a brain transplant i'm the same person I, I, you know I, i'm trying to i'm trying to get people to understand that uh, just because I'm having doing something that makes me happy, shouldn't make you unhappy. You know, you know what I'm saying? So that's what people need to understand. If something's making you happy, it shouldn't make me unhappy. It should, it should make somebody else, well, good for you. That's making you happy. They have to st step back. People need to step back and say, why is that making you why is that making you unhappy? What's making me happy? It's not my problem. What's making me unhappy about you being happy is my, it's, it should be your problem. You, do you understand? You know what I'm saying? And that's Absolutely. what and people have to really step back and say to themselves, what, what is making me unhappy about TJ being happy? 
because I'm the same, per I'm, I'm going to fight the fire the same way. I'm going to, I'm going to give somebody CPR the same way. Like if Jackie's a nurse, she's going to give her injections the same way. I mean, it's just like people have to walk in somebody else's, a mile in some, it's the old saying, walk in a mile in somebody else's shoes pretty much, but you know what I'm saying? Yep. And that's what I try to tell people, you know, and people, when they find out about me, they're like, usually they'll go, oh, they usually think I'm kidding, but then they find out I'm not. I'm like, you know, and then they don't care. But that they shouldn't care anyway, whether I was halfway transitioning or all the way transitioning. You know, that's what I try to tell people. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, TJ. I'm sure, uh, I know I have a couple of questions, which I'm going to save till the end, and okay. perhaps other people will as well. So, Amara? Thank you so much, TJ. We really appreciate it. It was really, really informative. Um, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, next up, we're going to have Jackie Barres. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Thank you. Um, Jackie is the director of Paraoperative para Quality and Clinical Anesthesia Manager, our WJ University not Hospital Nurse and Transgender Right Advocate. Jackie Barris established the first LGBTQIA hospital primary, hospital based primary um, care clinic in New Jersey, Proud Family Health at RWJ Somerset. Recently, she has launched the Proud Gender Center of New Jersey and New Brunswick. This center is the first of its kind in the state and offers a broad and comprehensive range of services and experts specializing in LGBTQIA care in a centralized location. You can go ahead and take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Can I just um, a shout out to a couple of my friends I saw here? Um, I know Miss Joan Hogan. She's a good friend of mine. And then Taji also. I just want to say hi. Surprisingly, I didn't know you're here. So now you're gonna hear my story. Anyway, I'm Jackie Barris. I'm a professional registered nurse with almost 20 years of experience. Uh, in my daily life, I am the director of quality. What it means is that I handle um, pre-admission, I handle OR, PACU, same day, central sterile supply, and I also handle the anesthesia, which means I am the quality person. They love me because I write people up. I write them up if they're not compliant. So they love me. My B, the Barris changed to different B. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> so pretty much, um, you know, um, the, the, the proudest moment that I have there is primarily for three years now, since I uh, assumed the role, we are zero deficiency from the CMS and Department of Health, something that I'm proud of. I am also the director for the clinical anesthesia, which means I have almost 26 anesthesia tech under my wing. Um, I have the uh, three lead techs and I have the rest as anesthesia. So they help our anesthesiologists. So basically I do payroll, I do staffing, I do management, hiring, um, you know, all those kind of stuff. So that's something I work every day also. And on top of that, I am also an LGBT health navigator for the hospital. What it means is that um, since we are doing gender affirming surgery at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, I am the personal assistant or the liaison for any patients going for surgery at Robert Wood, which means they will see me early morning, calm them down, you know, take care of them. I am like there, you know, to make sure because it's unknown when they're going for surgery. I just want to make sure that they're comfortable. Uh, they're not anxious. They know where they are. And I will be with them all the way inside the OR where they're going to have the surgery until they put them to sleep. And then when they're sleeping, I am going to see their family member. And what I do is I validate their tickets. So it's free. And I walk with them to Walgreens or Starbucks to kind of like give them an appearance that this is something that you should not worry. You know, you, you have someone that, that a member of the community who is really going to take care of you. And then once the patient is awake, you know, I do some teachings and they have all their medication and they're ready to go home. Since most of our um, gender affirming surgery are either the top surgery or we call it the chest or uh, chest uh, masculinization or chest feminization surgery. 
So I also run a support group every second Thursday of the month called Proudly Me. Uh, when we started this 2018, um, we started with um, seven, but it now averaging almost 50 every session. But because of COVID, we have to go now to virtual meeting, which is quite difficult because in my session, I give them free snacks, free dinner. Oh, where can you go there? A support group with free dinner. And you know what? It's different because, <coughs> excuse me, it's called Proudly Me Eduport Program. It's a combination of education and support program. And um, it's the two session where the first one is, I like to have the trans community in general and non-binary to teach them of certain, um, you know, we invite a lot of speaker talking about ways that we can integrate successfully in the society such as teaching them how to put makeup on, how to dress professionally, how you can have conversation, how can you be very visible in the community. We talk about hormone treatment, we talk about mental health issues, suicide, TDO, we, we just recently have the TDOR. Uh, we kind of change it because instead of talking the cost of their death, we talk about what do people remember these people. So. On top of that, I also teach with Rutgers, um, Masters in Public Health on LGBT, which I do classes every Tuesday. I do a meeting with my community uh, advisory panel, which is a member, which I facilitate. And I also do phone calls to all the patients. So if you're wondering if I sleep, yes, I do sleep. And I do eat. Uh, you can see the flag of the Philippines and the flag of America because I am also the president of the Philippine Nurses Association of New Jersey. I have 800 strong members. And you know, with the COVID thing, I have to respond to all our frontliners. So um, that's it. That's pretty much, I'm married also. I've been married for almost 15 years now with a cisgender heterosexual men. Uh, we've been together for, yeah, 15 years. Uh, I think there's no expiration with marriage contract. That's the only contract that doesn't expire. Um, I wish we can renew, but I got married four times with the same man. So that's something. So every got married, I got a ring, you know, put the ring on it, right? So uh, let me uh, get back to uh, I, I am from the Philippines. I moved to this country, which is now my country, our country, America, uh, at the age of 30. So I migrated here at the age of 30. So I was born and raised in the Philippines. Um, my father is a military and a lawyer, a perfect combination to have a trans child, right? So that is something that I will never forget because my father is a very disciplinarian. Uh, you know, you, it's, 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 uh, we also are a Catholic country. So pretty much my mother and my father, very religious. My, father, my mother is a teacher. Uh, she is a um, high, school, uh, high school teacher and she teaches, um, interesting, religion and physical education. So I have um, six siblings, four girls and one boy, and I am the youngest. So we, I was born, I'm 47 years old, proud to say 47, born 1973. And um, at a very young age, I knew there is something special, something different about me, something that I can't explain as to why, why I love my sister's clothes, why I love them wearing makeup, why every time they will go out and they will bring me as a chaperone, um, when my sister will bring, you know, will give me the chocolate that their suitors will give it. I love that feeling that, oh my God, I'm carrying the flowers and carrying the chocolates. I had so much fun and I don't understand why. And most especially, I find those gorgeous men, I feel so attracted and I don't know. Um, I am uh, raised with a, a big family, you know, Philippines, it's like one house, probably around 10, 15 people there. So I was with my nephews and my cousin, and I have some cousin, boy cousins that like to play guns and, um, you know, not now, you know, used to play guns and toy guns, not the real guns, toy guns, uh, cars. 
but I never like it. I like to play dolls. I like to do role play. I like to be a superhero wearing clothes and, and princesses. But you have to understand that um, I have to suppress that at a very young age because I was told many times by my mom, by my dad and my, my brother and sisters, you're not a girl, you are a boy. So you don't, boy, don't cry. Boys don't play like this kind of games or this. So that pervasive messages is something that I have to suppress. So one thing that I am good at is I am a obedient child. So I love to study, I love to read. So I just said, you know what? Let me focus on something that I am good at, which means I am becoming a teacher's pet. And if you know what teacher's pet, teacher's pet, you know, everything that they want you to do, you just follow. So I'm a very good student, I should say. And then moving forward, I went to high school. And guess what? My father sent me to all boys, exclusive school for all boys. And it's a Catholic. Imagine that, right? So knowing that um you know uh, and, and our principal is very strict because it is run by brothers it's called the salian brothers so the teachings is about being man for others being kind to one another guess what you know um they knew that i i am kind of like soft they knew that i identify myself different during that time the word that we use is gay because i'm attracted to a man i'm attracted to boys so they say that uh, they will subject me to conversion therapy. It's different therapy compared here. The therapy that they did is that they body me with some of the other boys. So like, you know, like body system where, so would you believe they, they partner me with someone whom I have a crush on? That's not gonna happen. So growing up, like we're going to the gym, we're going to movies, is going to pick me up instead of me being converted didn't work because now I feel like he is courting me he is going to my room and so the the whole shenanigans is it's different so I I had this worst feeling and then um I I have I feel like my call is to do service for the community uh, in the beginning, I'd like to be a doctor, but because we do not have a lot of money, I, at least here you can do scholarship or you can loan, we don't have that in the Philippines. So I said, you know what, let me be a lawyer. My father don't want me to be a lawyer. And he said, who will be your customer? No one will go to a, a gay lawyer or a, a trans lawyer, but uh, you know, don't be a lawyer. So I thought of thinking, I want to be a teacher because my mother is a teacher and it's a very noble profession. And I feel like I can teach a lot to my kids. But my mom said, you will be hungry because most teachers in the Philippines will not get rich. So guess what? You will not be able to support if you want to transition. So I was so confused, what am I going to do? Then finally, my sister said, my oldest sister, why don't you be a nurse? And maybe you can come to America. So in the nurse, like, no, I don't want to be a nurse. I'm scared about the, you know, I don't want to be an assistant of someone who's going to tell me what to do. I am a very strong personality. I need to do my own decision. And then finally, she convinced me and said, maybe it's an opportunity for you just to see the other country. Finally, moving forward, you know, I work in the Philippines as a man. Uh, with my old name, and I was able to work in a pharmaceutical company. During the times I was been exposed to different pharmaceutical medication, and that's where I started realizing, oh, there's such a hormones that maybe can change my, my physical appearance. But it didn't work because finally I got a call from the immigration say, your papers are ready. Are you willing to go? So I arrived here around 2003. The sad part is that my mom um, was diagnosed with cancer. So I have to send her back to the Philippines so that someone can take care, of, take care of her. And I cannot leave the country primarily because I'm waiting for my papers. Um, during that time, I am working 
24 seven here as a customer service. Uh, I work hard primarily because I wanna send money back to the Philippines so that I can help my mom. And to the point that I, we, you know, I, we have to, you know, my mom died um, a year or after she died from leukemia. And uh, that's one of the biggest, um, I should say, I feel so down that my world crumbled because the greatest ally in my whole life is my mother. And that is the time when I feel like I'm lost. I started to become rebellious. I, I went to New York, um, probably try to find my, my own identity. And I said, maybe New York can be the state where I can be who I want to be. Um, I tried to live as gay, but it didn't work. It's so different. I feel so lost. I feel so confused until finally I met my friend who used to be my hairdresser in the Philippines is now hairdresser or hairstylist in New York. So I was able to stay with him and become a roommate. And he started telling me, you know what? Why don't you be who you want to be? And I know that you're more feminine than me, you know, start dressing up. And that's when I start wearing wigs, wearing makeup and I dress up. And there is this club, which we call the straight club in Manhattan where all kinds of people were there. And that's when, you know, um, I go there, like I think every Friday. And uh, I think on the fourth time I was there, then I met my husband. That's when I met my husband and he didn't know I am a transgender. Um, I was probably the illusion of being too feminine. I think he knew then after we've been dating, we've been dating, asking me, I didn't know that in a second date, they're already expecting something. And I didn't know that. I was like, what are you expecting? You asked me for a date, let's go out, let's have fun, watch movie and everything. Until on the sixth time that I have to reveal to him that I'm not a real woman. Um, he didn't call for almost a month. And then after that, he called back. And then he said, you know what, F this. I am falling in love with you. So I'm falling in love with the person. I'm not falling in love whether you're, you're a man or you're a woman. I said, no, I'm not a man. I am a woman. Um, but you know what? I'm still wearing wigs. So finally, we, we got together. We lived for almost a year. And then we moved to New Jersey because my family is here in New Jersey. And they were kind of surprised because my total appearance is different. I'm starting to get, you know, softer face, softer features, but still short hair. I work in, in Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, and that's where my story begins. I got discriminated by using the bathroom because during that time, um, you are going to use your bathroom based on your um, sex assigned at birth. There's no law that protects us. Would you believe I am an educator and my co-educator is the one discriminated me? my own co-nurses are the ones who discriminated me. So I went to our human resources. They cannot help me because there is no policy that will protect about transsexuals. During the time it's transsexual, not transgender. Um, they said, you know what, Jackie, why don't you create a policy? And that's where I started my strong advocacy. Um, you know, I, I was called to, to swear to become an American citizen. I changed my name, I got married, everything fall in the right place. It's like the stars are all aligned. And I email everybody, the entire Robert Wood Johnson with my new name and my new gender marker. And if they have a problem, they can see the human resources. So with that, we move forward. That's when I started advocating first to myself. And you know, how do I do that? I advocate myself by being true to myself. I transition while I'm still working. So many good and bad stories in, in, in Robert Wood Johnson, but most good stories is when I take care of the patient. Just briefly to, to make you laugh, I have a very confused 89 year old woman and I'll never forget that. And of course, when you're working because I'm not fully transitioned that, I have a short hair and I tie my hair like this. And every time I will go in, she will get upset and say, I don't want a man in my room. I don't want a male nurse. I will pull my ponytail, 
sway my hair like that. Oh, you're a woman. Okay, now you can take care of me. So I have all these kinds of good and bad experience, but the, the real thing is I started advocating for myself, starting looking at the policy, looking at the things that will protect me. And surprisingly in New Jersey, there's no way to go to, to, to seek for hormone affirmation treatment. Everything is in New York. So which means I have to go to New York just to get my hormones, just to get my, um, my uh, to see my therapist. All the services are provided in, you know, in New York. And that's when they moved me to Somerset and I build this, what you call support group for the family and transgender, um, transgender families, like family member, spouses, wives of a transgender individual. The reason I, I, I build that is because a couple of years ago when I went home, my father was 90 years old and I told him, you know, I wanna have closure with him because now I live in America, he still lives in the Philippines. Why you never love me? And there was a total silence in front of my father, in front of my brothers and sister. I never felt that I'm part of this family. And they saw me like this. And my, mom, my father said to me, I don't think a father or a mother would do such thing to their child. It's just that I don't know how to respond to these things. I don't know what transgender means. I don't know anything. The only thing I know that you are my son. But since you don't know, you know, this is the, the words that is coming from him and he said, I wish I know that there are resources that can help me. I wish there are some psycho psychologists or psychotherapists that will help me to understand what you have to go through as you grow up. And if I've hurt you so much, I'm really sorry. So the bottom line, we, we re reconcile, we forgive and forget, and now we have a better relationship. And that's the reason why when I came back to America, I built what you call the proud transition this is for the family members, allies, spouses of a transgender individual. You have to remember, even if we as trans community transition, they also need to transition. So with that said, I did that. We changed the HR policy. I built the Somerset um, uh, LGBT clinic called Proud, now called Bob Sipperstein uh, Family Proud Health. And then I moved to to New Brunswick, um, I built the um, Proudly Me, which is a support group for the transgender and all those kind of stuff. What I am want to share with you, which something you can learn from, is being authentic is not easy, but being authentic is the reward that you can ever have in your life. Uh, you cannot please everyone. You know, we are coming from different culture, from different background, from different ethnicity. But I think one thing that I realized for us to be respected, we need to respect ourselves first. And I think that is a something that we probably don't show uh, as an LGBT community, as a community. Because if you notice, even among the community, even among the trans women, transgender group of women, they have some issues, whether you're, you're African American or black, whether you're white, you're Asian, among themselves, they are not united. They are fighting each other. They compete each other. That has to be stopped. We need to show a sincere solidarity as a group. Even gay and transgender, they don't get along. Lesbian and, and bisexual, they don't get along. As much as we say we are an LGBT community, we are not one. So I think for us to get respect from the community, the respect starts from us. And I think, I hate to say this, but with COVID, we should have been doing this for a very long time, that we need to treat each other with kindness. And I always believe that once you are kind, you know, the good vibes, the good, um, the good karma will come to you and always claim what the universe can give you. 
because it's limitless. And to me, I, I always say, how can I make be a strong advocate for the community? They say, if you're in Rome, be Romans. If you're in the Philippines, be Filipinos. So if I want to be in the board where I'm sitting with all the C leadership, then I need to be like them. And that can only be attained by your education, okay? By proper decorum, professionalism, everything you can say about how can you be similar to them. And that's the only way for you can make change. When they talk about disability, doesn't mean you have to be in the street fighting for human rights. No, visibility means you have to be visible in your own organization so you can make a difference. That's the best way to make a change when you can do public policy. And for the social workers who are here tonight, that is your call for you to change the world by doing what you love most and which is to serve your countrymen. But you can only change it if you're on the table. If you're not on the table, you are on the menu. They will talk about you. So be on the table so you can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jackie. That was that was absolutely beautiful, and I love that that last um, sentence. Um, if you're not on at the table, you're on the menu. That's absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. Um, so next up, we have um, a fellow club member, Amos um, Amos Kaffa, who uses the pronouns they and them. is a current senior at Rutgers um, School of Social Work and they are a Poetry Out Loud national finalist. Um, they have an award-winning playwright through the NAACP AXO and are nationally recognized by GLSEN for their LGBTQ advocacy. Amos uses their voice to bring awareness to social in injustices through written and spoken word poetry. Studying to become a social worker, Amos truly has the goal of changing the world one word at a time. So Amos, you can take it away with your spoken word, my friend. Hello, thank you for that introduction. Um, today I'm gonna to be reciting a poem I wrote titled, All Black Lives. Um, it's a bit personal and I'm a little nervous, so please everyone be nice to me, okay. To be honest, I don't know how to write this poem. I don't know. An artistic way to express the distress of knowing that. Too many Black women have been murdered this year, spent their entire lives in fear, and their deaths will not produce a tear from those who cheer Black Lives Matter. But what is that? An organization that campaigns against violence towards Blacks, but some followers have seemed to have forgotten that because black lives can't matter unless all black lives matter and all black lives includes trans but i still have yet to see any trending topics about that any hashtags about that any media coverage about that any black celebrities that give a crap an organization started by black queer women but how many people actually knew that you cannot claim to be pro-Black and recognize no Black people that are queer. We are not cons. It is so sad to see that we are our community's deepest fear. We are pushed below murderers, keep rapists in the home, but would kick out a child because of their choice of clothes then scream, Black lives matter. Black lives matter, but I am homeless due to people of my own complexion not seeing me as equal. We are the sequel, part two, to be continued because Black and queer are not the same thing, even though we are in the same race. You put a bullet to Malaysia Booker's face one month after the infamous date you filmed her being attacked in the public space. But this type of woman will never go viral. Why are we moving in a downward spiral at age 21? Claire Legato's life had just begun to be ended by the shot of a gun. Why? Are we suffering at the hands of our own people who view this life as a choice? 
as if to say there is something fun about having a life expectancy a little over the age of 31. If I die young, I know you won't come to my funeral. You will have a moment of silence and stay silent on the issues impacting my community. So while I'm alive as a black transgender, I must speak, I must scream, I must ask why does my black life not matter to you? Why does the makeup we put on our face paint a target for you to want to shoot? Why when amongst my people I seem to be some sort of black version of Katniss Everdeen, the tribute the sacrifice, but I did not volunteer to be in a war called everyday life I am suffering because it seems like the death of a black life has become a new form of entertainment. Why am I hungry for the attention of my own people who claim to hate Donald Trump's tactics? So why have you adopted them by building a wall to block my identity? When will black lives really matter to you? I guess we'll find out in part two. The black lives that don't matter to black people. Thank you. Mm. That was so powerful. And I want to tell you that when you said that you were going to do this in the meeting the other day, I knew you were going to come crazy. I knew that you were because I could feel the energy when you started talking about your feelings about the election and everything. I want you to know that absolutely you captured everything that I've been speaking on and that the rest of us queer black kids have been speaking on this entire time that everybody just wants to pretend like it's not, it don't matter. Thank you for saying that it does matter because it does matter. And that was so powerful. Nervous for what? That was so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I really appreciate that. That was powerful. So powerful. Um, so next up, um, we are going to open up for a Q&A. So um, if there is any questions, Dr. LaSalle, are we going to put these, these questions? Yes, put them in the chat. Yeah, put them in the chat or raise your hand electronically and I will try to find you. I think the chat would be the best. Yeah, put, it, put them in the chat. How many so people I'd have to scroll through. So yeah, put them in the chat. While I think we're will waiting, Dr. Lasala, you don't mind if I can share um, just to give a feedback on what Amos mentioned. And um, I think Amos, you captured, like I think everybody knows you captured. And I like that portion where you say, when you take a moment of silence, you can always be silence. And I think this is something that my stand about this, the observance of transgender of remembrance. We all know that the TDOR is for those who have been murdered because of bigotry and violence, discrimination and racism. I think we need to change the concept now, especially now that we're visible. I think we need to start lifting each other, show the world who we are, not what we are. Who we are is our own identity. And that means you're not just a student, you're not just a social worker, you're not just a fabulous queer or a fabulous transgender. You're not, we have all this kind of identity and find a strength where your identity can shine and flourish. That's where we should start as a community so that we can be um, you know, recognized in the society. We still live in a binary world, don't get me wrong but learn how to play the game. And to play the game, you attract, it's like Katniss Everdeen, right? How did you win the game? She knows how to play the game because she knows how to win people. That's the only way. Here in this country, one thing I learned is the majority. So when people ask me, Jackie, how were you able to develop all this kind of program? I start building my own ally. You cannot always fight, fight, fight. Nobody wants that. Choose our own battles so that you can win. That's always I say to the youth. 
I understand you're very passionate about your thoughts, passionate about your rights, but think, strategize, plan, and learn. My whole life has been a plan. People said I am crazy, but I have to plan it because life, you only have once. And if you don't plan it, either you go the wrong way or you go to the right way. Well, I'd rather go with my own way. And my own way means I need to plan. So. Thank you. I have a question to get us started off. Uh, before we got started, both you, Jackie, and you, TJ, said something very interesting. You said you don't use pronouns. Uh, when we asked you what your pronouns were, would you care to comment about that and talk about that? We're so now pronouns are such a big thing, right? We're all talking about pronouns and putting our pronouns up and stuff. So it's interesting to hear that perspective. So I'd love to hear what you both have to say about that. Uh, well, you know, I am way old school. I mean, that came way after uh, the LGBT. I, I mean, it's just like, I guess, cause I was LGBT that was it, you know? Um, and so after, I don't know, people kept adding to the alphabet, I guess. It was this LGBT, I don't know what it, what's Q. I don't need, is there more Q something? Sometimes there are, yes. Yeah, I don't know. So I, I don't even know. When somebody told me that I, I was even, I didn't even know what they were talking about. Um, I, I'm like, I'm 55 years old. I mean, I, I'm like, you know, I don't, you know, I've been married to Misty, God help her. She's poor thing has been married to me for 18 years. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I guess I'm not into the, I'm not out there and uh, I'm not the out there in the young, I guess probably like if I was out doing the club scene and the bar scene, I probably know all that stuff when I don't, I didn't know any of that, you know? So I, when people were saying, Hey, I, I guess that's what I don't, I'm not into, oh, that's young stuff, I guess, you know? So that's the younger generation, younger crowd. So I just, I just say, hey, just call me by my name, I guess, you know what I mean? I mean, like even like, so my my birth given name was, and, and I always kind of make, I made a joke about it even in my book, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm half Native American, I'm half Polish. I, you know, I always say that it must've been the Polak side that I was named after my mother. My, you know, my name is Terry Jr. I, I never had to change my name. So everybody called me TJ, you know? So I just said, just call me, you know, by my name. There was never no reason to call me. I have no idea what it even, I never got into the, that. So I just, that was just a younger generation. So I never, you know. Okay. I don't know. I agree with TJ. I think um, the pronoun is another form of labels and the labels where you, you, you kind of like separate, which is, which is from man and a woman. Culturally in the Philippines, we don't have he or she. So I'm used to in an environment where everything seems to be neutral, although we've been influenced by American in so many ways. But my thoughts is like DJ said, you know, to be honest with you, the most neutral name that I could ever have is my last name, our last name, because our last name doesn't tell you whether you're a man or a woman. It is a last name. So if you want me to call, you can call me, you know, Jackie Barris, call me by my name. I think that's the identity that, that speaks about me. I think I, I also um, echo what TJ said. I think this is where the new generation um, I cannot speak on behalf of the new generation because I'm not from that generation to begin with. The day and them is pretty much neutral, but I think they're coming up with pronouns because they don't want to be identified or he, she. But I think the most neutral is your name. Yeah. That's why I don't like to, to be put with any pronoun. And even I said, when, you're, when I'm teaching doctors, you know, if you're not sure about the name and pronoun, you're not sure whether that your patient is a male or female, then call them patient last name because that's the most neutral. If I say patient La Sala, you don't know if it's that man or woman. 
That is a very neutral. So why don't we just use our name? That's our identity and we should be proud of that. That's just my stand. And, and names, could, right. names could be e either, or Jackie could be, uh, in, uh, Jackie could be a male or a female. Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, Terry could be, you know, male or female. female. Yeah. I mean, there's so many names that are uh, intersex name. I mean, you know, it doesn't. Right. Just call somebody by their name. I mean, like I said, uh, yeah, it's yeah. the new generation. Interesting. Thank you. I'm going to read some questions from the chat now. The first question uh, that somebody has asked is my, uh, it was related to the issue of pronouns, I suppose. If I'm not sure what gender somebody identifies as, how can I respectfully ask, or is it better to just wait until the person volunteers what they prefer to be addressed as? And then I, I would imagine, again, we're a room full of social workers, so this might be client related as personal, but also client related. Um, if you're doing like a client related, well, the, 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 the best part is you have the forms for them to complete it. And in that form somehow guide you, how can I, you know, how, how will you call your, your client, whether he, she, because there, there should be an indication, what is my preferred pronoun? One thing that I, I don't like the word preferred because that's not my preference. It's my personal pronoun. So if for example, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm seeing here, Hannah Lothman, her pronoun she, her. You don't have to explain. When you go out there, I'm sure your pronouns has been used since you were a child, is she and her. Now as I identify as woman, why I can't have that pronoun? If you look at grammatically, I need to be called she and her because I am a woman. So that's the reason why I'm kind of like, why should I wait, use a pronoun? But if you're dealing with clients, then I think, you know, be proactive, let them sign the, the, the form. And I think that's the best way that you can avoid mistake or making mistake. When you have your forms uh, more neutral or more options, so that your client can completely fill it up, so. Great. Um, another question, can you speak more about how your cultural backgrounds and religions influenced your traditions, transitions, if it influenced it? I know, Jackie, you touched upon it, and TJ, I don't think you talked about that, so. Um, I, was, I was raised Mormon, um, so, uh, my, you know, um, being Mormon, you don't, uh, that's, uh, it's just like, it's like the cat, you know what, Mormon and Catholics are pretty, they mirror, the religion mirrors each other. They're pretty mm -hmm. much the only religion I know that they, they, you can marry without having to go to another cl class. Like if, a, if you were Jewish, you know, you wanted to marry somebody who was LDS, you have to kind of go to a class if you're, or vice versa. But so Mormon and Catholic are kind of the same, but you, um, it's, you know, uh, I, there wasn't too, I was so far gone after the Mormon church was, you know, um, I left the Mormon church, you know, after I was, a uh, an adult, um, you know, I have some, I have some Mormon friends, they know about me, you know, I have some missionaries that come here, Misty feeds them every once in a while, they know about me, you know, uh, I, and I'm getting ready, I, actually, I'm getting ready to go to one of the missionaries' uh, weddings, and they know about me. You know, I think it's, now it's, um, the Mormons have uh, kind of uh, uh, progressed a little. I wouldn't say a lot, but they've progressed a little bit. Um, it's, but as far as my religion, it didn't, uh, you know, as far, it wasn't looked upon it even to be gay. I mean, same, you know. I mean, I just, I mean, now uh, the Catholic, the Pope is even saying, you know, he agrees with uh, gay marriage. You know, uh, he was saying that. Civil too, like, union. Yeah, uh, yeah, civil union. Yes, excuse me. You know, so uh, I think the churches are progressing now, but back in, back then, you know, I mean, they didn't even want you to be gay, you know, so. I think culture play a very important role because somehow the, the culture is something that is your common belief and you were molded somehow as a person in terms of your culture, 
whether you're born in America, you have a certain culture. Go mm. to New York, they have their certain culture as a, as a city. Mm. Everyone has its own culture and culture should be celebrated. And it's similar to religion. However, culture, religion, and ethnicity should not define us. Right, yeah. Okay? It should not identify us as a human being. If you take away culture, if you take away religion, and if you take away um, racism or ethnicity, we are living in a perfect world. Because these three, whether it's religion, culture, or ethnicity, makes us different, and that caused the division. The, the Choctaw, I'm, a, I'm part of the Choctaw Nation, uh, my other half of my culture, and they would consider me a two-spirited, but we weren't raised um, with a lot of the Choctaw Nation, uh, you know, uh, we weren't, we didn't have like, uh, we, we didn't have a strong uh, Native American background uh, culture uh, per se. Like, uh, like Jackie was raised within the Philippines. We didn't, we weren't raised, we were raised in San Diego. So we were, we didn't have like a strict culture per se. Because in some indigenous cultures and or native cultures in the United States, People who are too spirited are revered and also seen as having healing powers and healing properties. Mm -hmm. I mean, some yeah. people have even written that the, the, the prejudices that we have in the West about uh, sexual orientation and gender identity are really unique to us in some ways, that lots of indigenous cultures did not see uh, gender expression in the same way. So like, like you said, Dr. Lasala, the, the, the binary is actually a culture. It, I think, originate from the culture, and that is a Western culture mm. that you only recognize two, um, two um, sex assigned at birth or two gender, male and female. Mm -hmm. If you look at other culture like Bugis Indonesia, they have already recognized five kinds of um, sex, uh, genders in their system. Right. Right. Some, like in India, they have the hijra who has kind of like, like you said, healing powers or, so those are part of culture. And I think when we talk about culture, it's not about your culture alone, but the culture around us. And that's the reason why we need to promote more cultural humility, which means you're understanding more of the culture of another and my own culture acknowledging it and how we can integrate our culture so we can have a better communication. Mm -hmm. Amos, people want to know, there's several questions for you in the chat. Um, and one of them is, um, can you talk about the use of poetry in activism and advocacy? Uh, your ideas you have about that, maybe plans you might have in terms of the future, how, how you've used them already uh, as tools of activism or, and advocacy and or how you plan to use them in the future as a social worker. Hello, um, thank you all for your support. Um, so, oh, okay. so I'm non-binary um, and my pronouns are they, them, their. And I saw that there was like a conversation before about it. So I just wanted to speak from like a Generation Z perspective. Go um, on. Yeah, because I was born in 1998, and I was fortunate enough to be born during a time period where, like, I had access to um, the internet. So I had access to representation earlier than I feel a lot of other people would have had access to representation. And I'm very grateful to have grown up during the internet because um, I just felt like I could see myself. And um, a lot of things that helped me come out were television shows and music. For example, um, Macklemore had a song called Same Love, and... Um, Hosier had a song called Take Me to Church. And those songs came out when I was around 13, 14 years old. And they really did help me um, come to terms with accepting myself. And I realized how powerful art is. And I'm a terrible singer and I don't know how to rap. And I found out that my most effective method for communication was through poetry because I'm an extremely shy person. Um, and my personality, like when I'm performing and I'm on stage is not the same as my personality when I'm not. So I was lucky enough to be able to find that poetry was my most effective way to communicate from participating in Poetry Out Loud, which is a high school competition. And it was the first time I noticed that like people would listen to what I had to say and people would pay attention. 
And I was like, oh my goodness, I have the ability to make people listen to me. And it was a new feeling because it was like, I don't know. I, like, I had never, never, never known that feeling before. People usually just ignore me. So um, when it came for me to come out as trans, non-binary, I actually came out in my school talent show um, and I recited a poem. But it was very nerve wracking because I didn't know what trans non-binary was before that. So I was confused for a really long time. Um, and then once I was finally able to find the terms to that fit me and that described me, it was a very rewarding and validating experience because for so long I was like thinking we live in a binary, thinking there's only male and female. But it's like, that's just like a very um, Western, I guess, thing because it's not technically new because there are a lot of cultures that recognize more than two genders. Um, there are a lot of cultures that recognize more than two sexes. And if we're speaking like factually, there are more than two sexes because intersex people exist and they don't meet the definitions of male or female. So it's necessary for us to have language to um, identify those people because as of right now, if you think about it, they don't technically exist. Um, recently, a few states like New Jersey, um, New York, California, have X markers on birth certificates now to represent intersex or non-binary people, but that's not something within all of the states. So basically I use my um, talent, I guess, poetry to communicate the ideas that I have and push the ideas that I have and hopefully um, people will listen to them. I hope I answered everyone's question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna skip a little bit with the questions. Um, Rose, would you be willing to verbalize your question? I think it would be more powerful if you if you did that, if you're willing. Hi, how are you everyone? I'm Rose. Um, so my partner just had a double mastectomy on Tuesday. We've been together for about four years and I, I work, I do my internships. So my only day off is on Sundays. I also have two kids. So I feel like I'm not providing enough support, especially after such a, you know, drastic procedure. And, you know, I, I try to take care of him as much as I can, but it's been a little bit overwhelming and I feel like I'm not doing enough. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, yes, he knows I love him and yes, he knows I support him and he supports me, but what are other ways that I can show him my support? What I, I'm just, it's hard for me because he's so strong and I don't understand what he's going through and I don't understand what he's, his emotions are. So it's, it's been a little bit hard for me because I'm already stressed out about work and school and internship and the kids on top of this. So it's, it's just been a little bit overwhelming. And actually this is the first time that I'm talking about his surgery and about him being transgender. I've never told anyone. <laughs> I'm nervous, I'm sorry. Um, Rose, first and foremost, <laughs> congratulations, because you know it takes a courage to, to say that in, in, in a platform like this. I'm used to it, so I'm always coming up, so it doesn't matter. Whether you put me in a closet or not, <laughs> I will always come out. But um, Everyone in coming out is very personal and I appreciate that. If I may just correct you, you don't mind if I may correct you. Double mastectomy is not the term. Mastectomy is you when you're removing the breast because of cancer. You're taking it away because the, your boyfriend is not having any cancer. So no. if I may just say for the rest, it's chest masculinization <laughs> surgery or That's chest what I you're That's what I know on there, but then it just came out because I, I was can. looking through a lot of YouTube videos and that's, I couldn't find anything that was like for transgender people. Yeah. It was all like cancer patients. Yeah. I'm just saying it from the education standpoint because I educate our staff on that. Because so uh, we want to be more um, affirming in terms of, uh, so, you know, sometimes, uh, were you born here, Rose? No, I'm Peruvian. Peruvian. I would say it's cultural. There are certain culture like us, um, yeah. probably you are similar because we've been, um, that we are kind of like hard on ourselves. Okay. And one thing I learned sometimes, um, 
Hi. Hey, Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? What? Good. I'm good. I'm just going for you. <laughs> oh, welcome. No, I welcome you. <laughs> In point, um, sometimes silence is a good thing also. Sometimes we don't have to, to say it. Sometimes it's the, the touch of the hand, the embrace, the love. You know, you don't have to say it all the time. Um, I'm sure he understands what you're going through. Uh, and as long as you're there to support, you know, communication is powerful. Uh, one thing I learned in, in a 15 year relationship is that you need to affirm each other, affirm each other. I think the reason why so many people um, ended up having divorce or separation is you should always remember why are you together? Mm -hmm. It's not about money. It's not about the business of work. And I've learned that from my husband who always remind me, even if we get old, why are we together? And that reminds me, I fall in love with this man because that is the answer. Why are you there? Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope I help. I hope I help you. Yeah, you did. Thank okay. you. Jackie. So just well, always remember that. What, what is your? Yeah. Go I'm ahead. Sorry, Go Jackie. Ahead. It's okay, sir. That's fine. Rose, what is your partner's name? <laughs> Spencer. 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 Well, good luck to you, Spencer. I hope you. Thank you for joining us. You must be in pain or at least discomfort you know so uh, you pulled yourself yeah. together to come say hi and we appreciate that thank you very much i was actually just taking him out <laughs> okay all right thank Good. you yeah okay uh, amara want to close us out Yes, so thank you so much everybody for coming. Um, and thank you to our three speakers, um, TJ, Jackie, and Amos. We really appreciate you guys sharing your experience um, and sharing some resources. Um, and if there are any questions, do you guys wanna leave emails or any type of contact in case anybody wants to reach out to you guys or anything? Yeah, I can. Uh... Would you be willing to put them in the chat? I also have their email addresses too, so I'll put mine in the chat as well. You have, Dr. Lasalas, do you have this flyer for my book? Oh, wait, put it close to the, put it close to the screen. This is my book, all my, all my contact information is on my book. All right. And can I say last word, Dr. Lasala? Of course. I always end this uh, for myself. Um, when people asking me, why are you fighting for equality? I don't, and I will not fight for equality because we can never be equal. A black will never be equal with white. Asian will never be equal with Latin, Latinx or Latinas. We can never be equal. A professor will not be equal. A woman will not be equal with men, but I will fight for humanity because we are all deserved with respect and dignity. Thank you. Yeah, it was really nice meeting you, Jackie. Yeah, so I, um, I have a, you can, anybody can, uh, Rose, uh, you and Spencer can get, if you have any questions, can get a hold, hold of me through uh, my website. My uh, email is on, uh, in this book, uh, if uh, you guys want, so I have that and uh, can get a hold of me through my publicist too, is on there as well. But, um, and repeat the title of your book. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, it's She, He, and Finding Me. Yeah. So. Um, and the publisher is? Uh, Alley Blue Media. You can and you can get it on the book. You can get the book on Amazon. All right. It's on Amazon. So, yeah, and my uh, email is on that. Uh, in the book and stuff like that. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, I really appreciate all of you guys showing up and I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Bye. Thank you, bye. everybody. Great. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Yep. Have a good Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.
Thank you, everyone who presented. Thank you, all in attendance. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. And special thank you to Amira, our mystery yeah. master day of, of, of ceremonies before everyone leaves. And shout Great out to job. Avery. Hi, Avery. I've been hi. Thank you, guys. Dr. Lasala, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Karen, thank you also. Bye, Michael.